Hi everyone, and let me begin by apologising for the mahusive dining room table which is looming in the background behind me. Uh, we're actually having some work done on the downstairs rooms at the moment, on the floors. I've mentioned before we're having work done in the house and today floorboards have been lifted, joists have been sawed, plaster has been hacked off, all kinds of interesting things have been happening and consequently the content of the dining room, all of the furniture and all the crap are um, effectively scattered to the four corners of the house and the dining room table has been dismantled and has ended up in this room. I think I might, maybe I should keep it and use it as a a place to put kind of, I could stick tarot cards on it and have like a tarot tableau behind me that changed for every video. Anyway, I'm rambling, partly because um, I wasn't planning to make a video today uh, for various reasons, um, but I have to make a video today because I have something very exciting in the post. And um, I know, I have said before on the channel, and many of you know that I am doing depth a year. And my depth year is consisting of not buying new books and tarot decks, with some exceptions. I've allowed myself some exceptions, and the exceptions are if there is a tarot deck or um, a book uh, that I am particularly anticipating and looking forward to. So not something I just impulsively see in, the, in this year and say, oh, I must have that, but something I've been wanting for a while. And the tarot deck that I want to speak to you about in this video very much falls into that category. And I'm talking about it like I'm building up to some kind of great reveal, but you'll know from the title of the video what the tarot deck is. And it is in fact the marvelous second edition of a newly published or very recently published second edition of the Intuitive Tarot by Scylla Conway. Now, a bit of background on my discovery of this deck and perhaps on the deck itself, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. I can't actually remember how I discovered the deck. Um, what I remember is that several months ago I found a video online, um, and I'll see if I can find it and if I can then I'll put it below, of Scylla Conway talking about her, I think more than one of her decks. She also um, has done the Oracle deck Divas of Creation, which I hear lots and lots of very good things about. Um, and for some reason I came across this video and one of the videos anyway was her talking about the development of the intuitive tarot um, and she told the story of how one day many many years ago she was painting and she painted what turned out to be the fool in the tarot deck and that is the fool um, and then over a period of time she went on and she painted uh, other images in the Major Arcana and had completed the Major Arcana, then waited for a bit and then started to do the minors. And um, she tells a story in the booklet that comes with this deck. It was published originally in 2002, 2003, I think. Um, uh, looked very nice online when I saw it. White borders with oval images in it, uh, very much like the oval image of the fool. Um, but at the time it was hard to come by um, and probably quite expensive. And for some reason I didn't particularly track it down at that point but what I did do was investigate where I might find out more about it and that led me to the Intuitive Tarot Facebook group that had been set up by Scylla Conway because she was in the process of working her way towards republishing the deck in a second edition and self-publishing it effectively um, to her own specification uh, as a second edition. And um, as a member of that group, I actually followed part of the creation process where Scylla would post images of the cards and um, and ask opinions about what kind of lettering to use and what color of background and should it be white again, should it be blue, should it be black, etc. And it was fascinating to, to watch. And uh, recently, Scylla announced that she was ready to publish and that it was all ready to go. And she was taking orders for, um, uh, preliminary orders for uh, initial uh, sale. And so I absolutely jumped at the chance and my deck arrived today. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk you through the deck. Um, I've had a look at it. Um, as I say, I, I know a little bit about the background of it. I've not had a chance to, to work with it yet, but I can tell you that immediately my reaction to the deck is extremely positive. So I'll walk you through the process I went through in receiving this deck. So the envelope arrives. I open the envelope and out comes this lovely chunky, chunky box and shrink wrapped. And there is something very satisfying about this pack 
because there's not lots of excess cardboard, there's not lots of bits that need to be taken apart. It's a simple flip top open box. Oh, a bit of a preview of what's in there. Um, it opens, hinges like a book, and inside the box, as you can see, there is printed a tableau of all of the images of the cards. And uh, there is a booklet uh, as well, a little white book, which is more than a little white book, it's like a little proper, pro properly published booklet. And um, I, I have had a chance to look at this. Let me put my cheapo Amazon glasses on, which are probably very squint as usual. And oh, look at that light. Oh, it's like Captain Scarlet and the Misterons in my glasses. That's amazing. I better not do that, I might blind myself. So, um, the Intuitive Tarot book looks really, really, really good. Uh, partly because it is not excessively large. Um, it gives a bit of background to the creation of the deck. Uh, yes, and it says here that it was in 1973 that she was doodling around and uh, doodling. Uh, on one evening in 1973, I was doodling idly and found I had drawn the tarot full, but one unlike any I had seen before. And she goes on to tell the rest of the, the story of how it was created and how it was published and then how it was uh, republished. Then it's split into a section on the Major Arcana and information about each of the cards, then um, a section on the Minor Arcana and a section on all of the cards, and then. Um, then there's a section on suggestions for using the Intuitive Tarot. And of course, the clue is in the name, the Intuitive Tarot. Scylla speaks in this booklet about how she developed the images of the cards intuitively. And so she encourages readers to um, approach the cards intuitively and to, to think about what, what the images invoke in them. Although the images are, are named, uh, they are very kind of, many of them are quite abstract in their feel. Um, and then at the end, she talks about psychological terms mentioned here, and the terms that are used will give you a bit of a clue, uh, I think, to, to where Scylla is coming from in her conceptualisation of tarot. Um, and one of the reasons I love this so much is that it very much chimes with my own approach to tarot. So uh, the, the psychological terms and names that are mentioned are Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, Dialoguing, Gestalt, Collective Unconscious, Archetypes, anima and animus and projections and she explained a bit about what each of those mean. So that's basically the overview of the booklet and um, very straightforward, very simple. What is fantastic is that each of the uh, entries for each of the cards includes suggested inter interpretation meaning and meanings for reversed uh, cards but best of all and I have I have had a bugbear about this in many of my videos recently you probably will have noticed when I've been reviewing decks or walking through decks and I've been intrigued by the imagery and I've said well let's have a look in the booklet to find out what the booklet says about the imagery and then you discover that it doesn't say anything about the imagery it's just kind of straightforward interpretations and you're left frustrated wondering why did the artist choose that particular image or why that colour or why that particular symbol? Here is the good news. That's exactly what Scylla does. So let me give you an example and let's stop waffling Brian and get on with the walkthrough. So I'm going to go through card by card and as usual I will stop when we get to an interesting one and I will read you a little bit out of the booklet so you get a sense of what it's, what it's like to engage with this deck. So um, the first one is the Fool. Uh, not surprisingly, and um, what you will see is, um, well, let me just read to you what it says, and then you get a sense of the information that, that you're given. So um, I'll read the interpretations first, because this, this probably will be quite familiar. Preparing to leap into the unknown, unexpected and inexplicable occurrences, a new path of destiny, possibly a warning to take care, pitfalls lie ahead, time to make major decisions, taking risks, paradox, apparent contradictions, and someone, it could represent someone who embodies the fool. And then reversed, an attitude that may be faulty in some important considerations, a whole world in the mind that seems right, but does not accord with anyone else's view of reality. And it says, particularly if the moon is nearby in the spread. A bad decision needs to be rethought. Reckless, thoughtless actions. So she um, goes into the potential reversed meanings of uh, the cards. But here's the information about the card itself. The fool traditionally represents the leap into the unknown and also the outsider, free of normal conventions and constraints. In his eyes, you may glimpse the wisdom of eons or the true fool, heedlessly blundering towards the cliff edge. Now, those are pretty 
um, compelling eyes. Um, if the latter, you may find that you feel inexplicably chaotic. An acute sense of discomfort may indicate that more is involved here than meets the eye. Where the fool is involved, however, it is wise not to make any assumptions. Prepare for the unexpected as far as possible, and be aware that he is taking a hand in your affairs. Check whether you or the person you, for whom you are reading are unwittingly treading a dangerous path. And wherever and whether you have taken all necessary precautions, then just stay open to whatever comes. The fool does not abide by our normal rules, so prepare for a roller coaster ride. So a very kind of an energetic fool there. Then we have the magician, and you'll see that this kind of uh, oval egg-shaped imagery is uh, structure is prominent in all of the cards. Um, and again, Sela talks in the book about how this just developed intuitively for her. Um, so let's just plow on a bit and um, we'll stop when we get to one where I go, oh, let's have a look at that one. You know, I usually do it on about card three or four. I shouldn't have to do this, but I will. Nudity warning, nudity warning. I always say that just because it means then if somebody does have a niggle about the fact there's nudity, I can say, well, you should have listened to the video. You should have listened to what I said, and then you wouldn't have been shocked out of your constrained live. Uh, there is the Empress. Isn't that a beautiful card? Now, hang on, I'm going to... In some of the lighter cards, I think the light might be a bit bright, so let me just turn it down. And also, that will help. Oh, you know, the Mistrons are still there. So there we have... The Empress. Gorgeous. The Emperor. I wonder what the symbolism in this I, I can't resist it. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to read this one. I don't know if it'll say anything about the imagery here, but we'll, we'll find out. Traditionally, the Emperor is seen as the embodiment of order and patriarchal leadership often appearing as a father figure for both men and women. His energy and willpower create great empires which he retains with focused control and force, while his foresight usually enables him to circumvent problems. Under his aegis, science and the economy make great strides but at a high cost to humanity. He condones greed, slavery, war and torture. In his eyes, the ends justify the means. Um... The Emperor is never secure, constantly looking for threats to his authority. He is, he is a ruler based on fear. His answer to any perceived threat is to clamp down with an iron fist. Conquering and killing his neighbours is done for aggrandizement, for security, a bulwark. The fact that untold misery is caused to other human beings is a painful necessity. He becomes the archetypal testosterone-driven male. His symbol, the Roman symbol of virility. I think we get the drift there. So, the Hierophant. I love the fact that these, um, these cards have got no borders, but um, a base border with the, the title and um, the numbering on it. And then it really lets the images just pop. The original deck, I believe, had um, white borders, which I think probably would have also looked good, but this, I think, really looks very striking. So, um, um, now we have the chariot. Now, this is my birth card. Isn't that lovely? Real sense of power and energy from that card. Justice. The colours are fantastic and I love that they change from card to card so you really get a sense of the energy of the the changing of the energy. Oh by the way I should have shown you this is the back of the cards which is a very um, interesting almost kind of well I was going to say fractal but it's almost like more a, a more a kind of um, uh, um, like wrought iron kind of, it's like a cross between a wrought iron design and something you'd find in deep space. The wheel. Now, you will have noticed probably that um, number 
eight was justice and so number 11 is strength and um, what I notice here is that this image and some of the other images that we'll come across well here's another another one actually the hanged man um, both of these cards and their imagery really remind me of the Thoth deck um, and so there is something of the style of artwork that is reminiscent of Lady Frida Harris and there is something about the actual uh, the way that the symbols are used that is reminiscent reminiscent of the Thoth but it's not overt and so it doesn't leave you thinking this is a Thoth based deck and in fact some of the images I think um, and the way that the deck is constructed are reminiscent of Rider Waite Smith but really it's a thing in itself it's a thing in itself so the intuitive vibe comes through now I'm about to show you what what probably is my favorite card in the deck um, I just the first time I saw this it was just breathtaking very moving card to me and it's death just look at that that is lovely now I'm going to read you I just want to see what it says about the image here so the wisdom gained with the hanged man takes us to a still more fearful place, face to face with the red rimmed eyes of this grim skeletal figure, who challenges us to step through him into the white hot alchemical flames of transformation. So there's an example of where the image, although it might be kind of abstract and intuitive, you know, we're given, given an indication by Silla Conway, the artist and the creator of the deck, of why she's chosen this imagery. His shield depicts a diamond midway between an open cocoon and its emerging butterfly, symbol of transformation. Framing both is an arrow pointing downward, signifying that if we survive, there is yet further to go. So um, lots and lots of uh, very beautiful imagery in here. Um, and you can see obviously the downward pointing arrow down there. Uh, we all know death is, is a necessary part of life, but it usually re remains a mental concept, not an emotional reality. All ancient mystery religions, shamanism and today's deep self-awareness work, however, describe initiations where we encounter our own death. The initiators test us, weigh our souls, and if we prove worthy, dismember or burn us to free the spirit within. In our own visualizations and dream work, we can experience the feeling of stripping away the external dross to find the treasure within. Very powerful. Temperance. That one reminds me of something you might see in the Aquarian Tarot, actually. What I love is that some of the images are evoking other decks that I really like and yet remain a thing in themselves. As usual at this point, I'm going to speed up, otherwise we'll never get through the deck. But I will stop again when we get to perhaps some of the minors. Um, and one of the things that Zilla has explained in the book is that she does not accord with the traditional um, elemental association with the minors. Well, not with two of them anyway. Um, and she explains why. So when we get to that, I shall um, read you some of that. Oh no, that's out of order. Did you spot the deliberate mistake? So we went from the star, then for some reason we went to the world and judgment, then, then we've got the star, then we've got the moon, then the sun, then judgment, then the world. Right, okay. You can tell I was looking at this earlier. So let's go back. The tower. The star. The moon. Wow, the sun. Amazing burst of energy from that card. Judgment. And the world. Since it's the last of the majors, let's just see what it says about the world. Her arms thrown wide in ecstasy, the figure of the world gazes up into the light of the galaxy above her. The divine child is now the centre of the cosmic dance, and the energy of creation flows around her. The journey is complete, the treasure attained, and the integrated soul combines all polarities into the greater whole. This is the culmination of the quest. 
total integration of soul, body and mind with the mystery of divinity. The oval motif is now seen as the cosmic egg that contains the universe, the unifying totality of creation. Traditionally, the world represents the culmination of the quest, our end and our beginning. The figure is androgynous, her female form indicating the original X chromosome that contains within it all sexuality. She is the anima mundi, the conjunctio, the mystic marriage of matter, mind and soul that was the ultimate goal of the alchemists. It is a mandorla, symbol, a symbol of psychic wholeness. You may choose to see it on a more mundane level as success, attainment, joy, although the card will always contain within it the element of union with the greater whole. Lovely. So, um, now I started with the Fool, um, and Tilla starts with the Fool, and actually ends with the Fool. So we actually go back to the Fool in this deck, and um, it's just a reminder that that really chimes with me, because one of the things that I am... Um, talked about in my Tarot to the Nine series is very much about the idea of, of the fool stepping out of, 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 um, not, uh, out of nothingness into somethingness, out of non-duality into duality, and then returning, always returning. So um, that is the Major Arcana. Now, uh, let me just see what it says. Uh, okay, so yeah, so this is what she says about the elemental associations. The system used for the minor arcana and in intuitive tarot differs from many tarot decks. Cups and coins are mostly traditional, uh, with cups being watery and coins earthy. However, the normal alignment of batons or staves with fire and swords with air have been reversed. I understand why people link fire with creativity. After all, we speak of the creative fires, but I have always seen batons as green and growing, drawing strength and creativity from the earth and air. Stave court cards are intuitive, can be slightly ungrounded and highly creative. Swords, on the other hand, are forged in fire, and sword court cards are highly passionate, though as they keep their passion well damped down, they often appear cold and distant. Now what's interesting is when I first opened this deck and looked at this card, my immediate thought for the one of Batons was, oh, this um, suit is... This um, this suit is being associated with the element of water because of the watery colours and the, the kind of flowing and so on. But what I realise now is that these are air bubbles and this, this wonderful kind of um, flowingness of the air. Um, and so what we have here is the, the airy batons rather than um, uh, fiery ones. So one, two... I love that um, curling. I suspect there might be something in there about, um, well, I'm getting something from it around kind of, uh, about DNA almost, um, a sense of the DNA almost being the, um, uh, the reminder of, 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 of life and um, that cosmic egg idea. Um, mm, so it says here, the focus of the Three of Batons is a strange and beautiful egg. It's shimmering colours pulsing across the surface. The figure holding the egg, caressing it with careful fingers, seems almost awestruck by its qualities. St twin strands of, of energy, the double helix of life, emerge and interweave through the three interlocked batons above. An oval tunnel of light in the background echoes the egg shape and frame of the card. So, wonderful. Four. Like one of those timers, isn't it? Those um, old time uh, globe timers, like the one that the Wicked Witch uses in The Wizard of Oz. She turns it over and goes, oh, yeah, you know, I'll give you a DM! Or whatever it is she says, I can't remember. I don't know why I'm thinking about The Wicked Witch when, when I'm looking at this tarot deck. There's nothing in here that makes me think of The Wizard of Oz really, apart from that. Five of battles. Six of battles. Way! Top of the world. That's lovely. Seven. Eight. What energy in that card? It's like the eight of batons, eight of wands is always about energy and movement for me. And that is like the kind of thing you see if you're standing on a train platform and a train whizzes past. That kind of multiple image thing. Nine of batons.
and 10. And now we're heading into the courts. Knight. Page. Very kind face. Queen. That queen reminds me of Grace Jones on one of her album covers. Wonderful. And King. So now we're moving into swords, which are the fiery ones. Um, I'm aware, by the way, that I'm showing you, you these uh, in a different order to how they're listed in the deck. So I probably muddled them up somewhat. I mean, in terms of the sequence of the courts, you know, from cups to swords to uh, etc. Uh, but that's fine. One of swords. I'll speed up and if you do need to stop and pause on any of these images, obviously, you can do that. So again, that, that is a very traditional Rider Waite Smith image. Um, so there's influences in here of other decks and, but also, um, a real sense of intuition. Now I'm not, uh, I don't own soul cards um, and I know that lots of people are fans or are, are a fan of soul cards um, and I must admit that I actually am not overly fond of overly intuitive images um, partly because I find them sometimes a bit confusing or I find that I just don't get a very clear message from them. Um, what I love about this is that this deck clearly has a system and it's a system that is familiar enough to those of us who understand tarot that um, it's very workable. I'm just going to put these cards out of the way so they don't fall over. Uh, it's very workable, um, but there is something very intuitive about these images. So I can I can feel that I would get quite a lot just from looking at the images. Never mind understanding the meaning of the cards. So it kind of works both ways. You've got this wonderful tarot system that you can use and you've got this uh, intuitive set of intuitive flashcards that operate as their own thing. So there's the one of discs. Now I, I'm going to guess that there's going to be something in there about the um, the idea of the mandala and the Jungian, uh, Jungian idea of the mandala. I can just find discs. Um, the one of coins depicts the awesome power of manifestation and physical energy, symbolizes the deep blue diamond, the mystery that binds the universe. Moving inward, we see the in interconnected spiral galaxies of the cosmos and the light of the burning stars. Journeying inwards again, we reach our own sun and finally the earth with its four cardinal points. At the center is the sacred double triangle summarizing the hermetic tenet as above, so below. The one of disc is traditionally thought to be about the senses, grounding, firm foundations, wealth, and material comfort. Underlying all is the balance between the material senses and the spiritual. At the center of the disc, the two interlinked triangles show the union of opposites, essence and substance, consciousness and unconsciousness. The one can therefore be a profoundly spiritual card, offering a connection to the source through the senses and the dimension of physical existence. So not an actual mention of mandala, but to me that just really reminds me of Jungian mandalas, which of course are about meditating and helping one get to a connection with one's self with a capital S. Two of discs. That's like magnetic energy, isn't it? Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight.
They are lovely, lovely images. And um, oops, the card I've slipped. Now, I, I commented on the card um, backs. I should also comment here's the Queen of Discs on the card stock. Very nice, firm but flexible, um, laminated but not overly laminated. It's got a nice feeling to it. I think these will shuffle very well. They're quite large, but you could shuffle um, sideways. I probably would do that because my hands aren't all that big. Um, but those with big hands could do it that way. See, I'm dropping even one card. Um, but they're lovely. The size of the cards is perfect for the artwork, so I would not have them any smaller. Queen, King, and now we're on to Cups. Now, I think I got them in the wrong order. I think I was meant to do cups first, but that's okay. We're very free and easy here. One, wow. That is lovely. The faces in there, universes. Two. The color scheme in the cup cards is particularly gorgeous, I think. Wonderful. A mix of blues and reds and purples and greens and oranges and just look at this four of cups isn't that splendid five six seven eight I love the use of um, space in the card as well, so this use of kind of lightness and space just gives them such a lovely open feel. Nine of cups. Ten. Eleven. Page. Night. You can tell this is about water. I'm going to assume that's water anyway. Queen. Wow, powerful. Now the Queen of Cups is my um, card. If I if I Myers Briggs myself, and then look at how the Myers Briggs arc, uh, the Myers Briggs types relate to the court cards, I come out as the Queen of Cups. That's okay. I, I, as a representation of my inner female self, my is it animus or anima? I can never remember. What's the, which way around is that? I need to remind myself. I know this. I have. I do know this because I've studied it, but I always, always manage to get it wrong when I need to know. So, um, but handily, in the back of the book, there is a glossary. So let me read it to you. See, this is how you use this. You think to yourself, is it anima, is it animus? And you go, ah, oh, it's in the book. And you look in the book and it says, Jung's terms to indicate the unconscious feminine side of a man and the unconscious masculine side of a woman. However, it's more complicated than that. If we find ourselves powerfully um, drawn to someone of either sex, it's usually because the person has activated an inner archetype, not necessarily an anima or animus of some sort. These archetypes are utterly compelling. They can cause us to fervently believe that the other person needs us as much as we need them. In fact, if we allow any archetypes to rise to the surface of our consciousness, we are at risk of their effect on our behavior. All tarot readers will have tried to read for clients in the throes of difficult relationships. And although not, not all of these relationships will have been forged in the archetypal realms of the mind, relationships themselves somehow activate the pleasure centers of the brain. Unfortunately, the end result of successful relationships is, of unsuccessful relationships is far from pleasurable. Um, so yeah, so it's my anima, isn't it? If I am looking at um, my unconscious female aspect. I'd be all right with that as my anima, or of her as my anima. I think she would be a force to be reckoned with. Now, where am I? I see I've completely confused myself. I've done the 10. Queen of Cups. King of Cups. And that, my friends, is the wonderful Intuitive Tarot. Beautiful cards. And yeah, I would say pretty um, easy to shuffle because they're they've got a lovely um lightness to them and slipperiness to them that uh, means they don't get stuck i don't get the impression that these cards are going to um 
chip or uh, bend very easily. I think you probably could riffle shuffle with them quite easily. I'm not a riffle shuffler, so I'm not even going to try because then we'll have cards everywhere and they'll be hidden behind the dining room table and I won't be able to find them. But flexible, um, firm, lovely, lovely images. And um, I don't know, why don't we just give them a shuffle and I will cut the cards for all of you and we will pick a card to see us into the night, because that's what it is here now. It's night time. And what a pleasure to finish the day walking through the Intuitive Tarot by Scylla Conway. So thank you, Scylla. Lovely deck. Great job. Looking forward to working with it very much indeed. And the card that we get, if we cut, is the High Priestess. What could be better? One of my favourite cards and an absolutely beautiful one at that. And I'm not going to read you what it says in the booklet because I'm going to challenge you to let your intuition do the talking. So there you have it, the High Priestess. And what I might say to you, I think Scylla even suggests this in the, um, in the book, it might be worth asking yourself the question, if I didn't know, those of you who do know, what the High Priestess represents in tarot. If I didn't know that, what would this image tell me? So that's the question I'm leaving you with. Comments below, go to uh, the Facebook group, I'll link to that below as well. Interact with Scylla there, get your hands on the deck if you like it. It's a beautiful deck and I'm very glad that I um, opened up my depth here to get this deck because it's one that I think will take me deep. Thank you Scylla. Thank you everyone for being here and I'll see you all again very soon.